In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and always holy. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, and happy Father's Day to my father and to all your fathers and grandfathers and anyone who is a father figure in your life. And most importantly, happy Father's Day to our beloved father, Father Luke, who fathers this community with his love, patience, and energy. And I wish all of you a great day. It's a great coincidence that this celebration falls on the second Sunday of Matthew, in which we read the Gospel that describes how Jesus called his first disciples, the two brothers, Peter and Andrew, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. This call to be a disciple of Christ is a very interesting and special thing, and that there are elements to it that are similar to the calling of being a father. You see, Jesus called his disciples to teach them, but the calling required to leave everything and follow him. He did not invite them to a class or to a Bible study session. Come, let's sit and discuss the scripture and then go back and do what you usually do in your life. No, he asked them to leave what they were doing, leave their nets, leave their father and follow him. Follow him to the unknown. Unknown from their perspective, but known from his perspective. And why is that? Why the need for that drastic maneuver? He could have taught them as the other Pharisees taught in the synagogue. What Jesus had to teach them could not be taught in that manner. The content of the course, if you want, cannot be given to the student in scripture or a PowerPoint or a podcast or a YouTube video. It required something else. In this day and age, we sometimes question why we have to go to a classroom to learn. I've been visiting some colleges, campuses right, lately, and the things that the faculty members complain about the most is that students do not show up to classes anymore. They get their content from other places, and they seem to pass the exams, and then they think that they've acquired the knowledge needed. And we all do that. We need to fix something in the house. We, do, we go watch a do-it-yourself video on YouTube, and boom, now we are plumbers, and now we can fix the heater or the dryer or whatever. Can we do the same with catechism, with learning our faith, or getting to know God? The answer is no, we can't. And Jesus knew that, and he knew that to impart that type of knowledge on these men and women that he chose, he had to take them on a journey of transformation. And that journey cannot be achieved by giving them a book to read or explaining a piece of scripture. No, it required them to detach from what they were doing so that they can focus their attention on what he was going to provide them with. And that journey of transformation is a journey of transforming the mind. He needed them to be immersed in the life of the Christ, to transform their mind to become what we call today Christians. And transforming the mind leads to transforming decisions and actions that we take, and therefore transforming our life in this world. It all starts with the mind. Compare these disciples with the Pharisees, who knew all the scriptures and had the good intention of following them to the very last comma and period. But they did not have their mind transformed. They were like robots, following commands. Do this, don't do that. Eat this, don't eat that. And Jesus did not want this for his disciples. He did not want this for us. Hence, in our church, we have this call to change, a call to convert 180 degrees from the life in this world to the life in Christ. And that can only be done by immersing ourselves in the life of Christ. So I hope this is clear that we are not solely to rely on our logic and brain and reason, but rather we have to absorb everything else that we cannot explain in words. And this type of discipleship is, with, is what we are supposed to experience in being in the church. The apostles lived with Christ each day of their lives after their calling. And they saw how he walked, how he slept, if he snored, they knew it. And if he saw an insect on the side of the tent and how he dealt with that, they saw that. And if he burnt his hand while trying to eat something from the fire, they saw that. They saw, saw how he dealt with these small events and that how he reacted to all these events and that that seeped into their mind that they can fully understand and learn how the human nature and the godly nature are supposed to interact with each other. 
And then when you see that, when they saw that, they started mimicking those things. Without them knowing, they started copying it. You notice that if you spend too much time with some other person, some osmosis happens between you and them, that you start mimicking some of the words they say, some of the expressions they use, some of these small actions. And this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is the critical element of fatherhood. The child whose mind is growing sees a lot what the father does, how the father in the family expresses his existence in this world with these small matters, which probably he took from his own father. And this memory across generations transfers itself to the child, making the child a disciple of the father without any intention of the father teaching or the child to learn. It just happens. And this transfer of knowledge, or whatever you want to call it, transfer of mind from generation to generation creates the responsibility of the father to watch out and to filter and to improve on what is going on. So if you get what I'm trying to say, that there's this conduit of knowledge transfer happening from one person to the other, this conduit that Jesus used to teach his disciples how, to, how the human and the godly nature need to interact with each other, is the same conduit that exists between father and child. So now the question becomes, what do we pass along to the child or to the disciple? If we recognize that there's this invisible pipe between us and the children, what do we want them to become? We can ignore its existence, and then the child will probably just copycat us, the parent or the father. Or we can acknowledge the existence of this conduit and try to ensure that we pass along the family traditions, the heritage, which many people purposefully do. But is that it? Is that enough? There's a story of this young altar boy who was standing inside the altar while the bishop was being vested or dressed. You know, when we deacons and subdeacons, we vest the bishop one piece at a time, and we say a particular prayer as we put it on him. And the bishop has many pieces of clothing, maybe nine or ten that get put on him. So this altar boy was standing there watching this. And then he says to the bishop, with every piece you put on, you disappear a little. And then I can no longer see you. And this is the true wisdom behind the service of clergy. We are meant to hide our human nature and only project the heavenly nature. The deacon hides his face behind the gospel as he processes. The priest hides his face behind the chalice. You are to see heavenly things. And so it is the same that we are to pass along to our children, heavenly things. So in this conduit I mentioned, we as fathers have to pass less of ourselves and more of the heavenly things. And we do that by trying as much as we can to do heavenly things, like crossing ourselves more in front of our children, praying, saying, Lord, have mercy when something bad happens in front of us, instead of swearing or expressing anger. I know this is not our nature, but we have to put the effort to hide our nature and show the nature of Christ. Instead of rushing to be the first at doing something, we may want to take our turn or try to be the last. We try not to raise our voices in arguments. We try to turn the other cheek, forgive those who publicly insult us. These small things transfer over from one generation to the other, and they transfer to the mind of the person, allowing the children to be on the right path towards their salvation. And for those that things that are hard for us to achieve or control, we should acknowledge those in front of our children and let them know that even though they may see us do those things, they should watch out and not do them themselves. So if we do this, then we are, we as fathers have created from our children's disciples not for us, but for Christ. This is an important part of fatherhood and puts an important responsibility on the father to act, not based on his will, but on the will of God, which will lead to the salvation of his child. And in doing so, in living the struggle, the father also gets saved and the child is put set on the right path. We see the glory of God in this. Not only is the father saved, but the child too. And that is how these 12 disciples became millions and billions of people later on, generations after generations of Christians. And they will continue to grow in the second coming, until the second coming. So this is how the mind of God, the Holy Spirit, propagates from one person to the other in these small things, not in theological discussions and arguments and classrooms. 
So let us each play our role in this, and I pray that God will grant all the fathers the wisdom, the strength, and the discernment to transfer the life of Christ to their children. Amen.